All right, so we're going to move on to a new chapter now, vector-valued functions. Um, in case you're wondering, change of attire, it's, it's 36 degrees outside and smoky. It's 26 in here even. It's too hot for a suit, so uh, polo it is. Um, and this is the last chapter that I need to record, and we've got the entire book covered. Um, so, vector-valued functions. Let me do a quick recap of parametric curves, because a lot of what we're going to do here is very closely related to the content you've already seen on curves in the plane. All right, so remember that of the various ways we can draw a curve in the plane, we've seen three, I suppose, right? Uh, we can graph a function. We can write y as a function of x. We can graph it. Um, and well, we've seen a number of examples to demonstrate that that doesn't capture all the sort of interesting curves that we might want to look at. So then we move on and we look at like uh, curves that are defined implicitly, right? Um, and so we have some equation relating x and y, and that broadens things further. But we can go even further by looking at parametric curves, right? Um, and the idea with parametric curves is you now have, you know, and they can do all kinds of interesting things, right? They can curve back on themselves. They can loop around. They might even cross themselves. Perhaps even more than once, who knows? Okay. Imagine that's some, I, you know, I just drew a curve. It happens to be a closed curve, right? Not all parametric curves have, have to be closed. This one is. Um, but the idea here is that you parameterize the curve. So each point is given with coordinates x and y. But x and y are considered as functions of t. Right? So t will vary maybe over all real numbers or maybe just in some interval. Um, and as t varies, you trace out the curve. And so parametric curves are usually sort of viewed as sort of a more dynamic object than just a graph because you kind of imagine t as like a time parameter. And so you think of that point on the curve as sort of moving around the curve and tracing it out as t varies. Okay? So, now we're going to take just a slight shift in perspective here, and we're going to, you know, think back to the previous chapter on vectors, and we talked about the fact that, you know, uh, if you think about a vector in that sort of standard position with its tail at the origin, right, we can sort of identify any point with the corresponding position vector, right? So that point, x of t, y of t, right, we can draw a vector from the origin to that point. Should have brought red for this. Oh well, um, we'll make do. Uh, the yellow and green are kind of close together, and and so we can now think about some vector here. Maybe call it R, right? But that vector also depends on t, right? So we have say R of t equals x of t, y of t, right? And we can write it down like that. And it's, it's really, it's exactly the same information, right? Uh, and again, maybe we, maybe we specify some domain here, right? T goes from A to B, right? Other than sort of a, a question of perspective, there is really no difference between a parametric curve in the plane as you've previously studied and this vector valued function. There are really two objects um, which are you know, they're, they're just two ways of looking at the same thing. Uh, one key difference, though, is that we know that with vectors, we don't have to draw them with the tails at the origin. And so we're going to see scenarios where it will be useful to transport those vectors. Uh, in particular, we're going to see that one of the objects that we can consider once we get to the next section on calculus is that, you know, at any point on a curve, we can ask, well, is there a tangent vector to the curve? Not just a tangent line, but a tangent vector that indicates the direction of motion, right? Um, and uh, conveniently enough, and this is maybe not too surprising, that tangent vector is just going to be the derivative. This makes sense if you, you know, if you're used to thinking about things in sort of like, in terms of like physics and motion, that if you take the derivative of position, you should get velocity, right? And instantaneous velocity, if you're thinking about motion now in, in two or more dimensions, right, um, it's no longer just that kind of slope giving you your speed. The, you know, the velocity is telling you also 
the direction of motion, right? So velocity is a magnitude and a direction. It's a vector. So it makes sense that we want to think about vector-valued functions, right? Um, so that's basically this is what a vector-valued function is going to look like. We, we write x and y as functions of t, and instead of sticking it into a point, we stick it into a vector. And then you can kind of imagine that as t varies, well, this vector is going to change, right? It's going to shrink and stretch, and it's going to rotate. And you can imagine that that arrow kind of, you know, the tip of the arrow traces out the curve. Um, imagine it as some kind of like very fancy um, pen or drawing device or something that's anchored at a particular point, OK? Um, so we have x and y. They're just regular old real valued functions of t as we're used to. Uh, and we can do that. Now, uh, the nice thing about vector-valued functions, we can take things one step further. I mean, you can, you can talk about parametric curves in higher dimensions as well. And, and that is something that's going to come up later on. Uh, we'll see a bit of it in this chapter. But we could also think about a vector-valued function where the vector, right, the values taken by the function are vectors not in the plane, but in space. We could have a three-dimensional vector-valued function. And, and same idea, right? There's some point in space, position vector to that point, and we get r as a function of t, right? And so the tip of the vector would be at a point, x of t, y of t, z of t. Okay. And now as t varies, well, x, y, and z, they're functions of t, so they're all going to change as t changes, and that's going to change the vector, and so the vector is going to move around. It might get longer, it might get shorter, it might turn, and, and as it does that, it's going to trace out some curve, right? And maybe it goes around and then, oh, now we're in three dimensions, so maybe it doesn't even have to intersect itself. It passes underneath itself, right? And we can now we can get all sorts of interesting curves in space by using vector-valued functions with three components, right? Um, so that's the context for this chapter. Functions of a single real number variable, but the output for the function is not going to be a number, it's going to be a vector. And that vector is going to be either two or three dimensions. And we're going to use these essentially to describe curves in the plane or in space, but also other quantities that we can associate with that curve, like a tangent vector for example. So we'll be developing that over the next few sections in the textbook and of course the next uh, series of videos.